All right, we're live. Welcome to another episode of Turf Chat. This is episode 34, and we're going to uh, fortunate to have Gordon Goffman with us from Greg Brothers, and he's going to um, give a basic overview of fertility, fertilizers, and uh, some of the differences between granular and foliar fertilizers. So it's uh, always a good topic to talk about these things. Um, before we get started, I do want to go uh, left to right, as we always do, and allow our guests to introduce themselves. Gordy, we obviously are going to hear from you, but why don't you just introduce yourself uh, first? All right. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Thanks for participating. Uh, my name is Gordon Kaufman. Uh, I'm a uh, agronomist and uh, technical representative with uh, Greg Brothers, um, Foliar Fertilizers, and um, I also coordinate uh, our research and uh, development. Good. John? Yeah, how are you going, everyone? Good evening, I should say. Uh, John Dempsey here. I'm from the Curra Golf Course in County Kildare in Ireland, or superintendent there. Also working towards my PhD in turf grass pathology in Bristol, in the UK. Good. Paul? Good morning. My name is Paul Robertson. I'm the superintendent of Victoria Golf Club in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Okay, and I'm John Kaminsky, Associate Professor of Turfgrass Science at Penn State and Director of the Two-Year Turf Program. Um, we'll have time to promote anything that we have coming up uh, towards the end of this. Uh, I think we'll get started by just jumping right into it. And so this kind of idea came up. We we're always trying to have some ideas for Turf Chat and how we're going to present different topics. Um, because these are recorded and they're made available on YouTube later, uh, it's nice to kind of give these overview type discussions, have a little bit of chat, and then see where the conversation goes, and then people can follow up and watch it live online. Uh, we do have some viewers out there. I'll remind everybody that's watching live, if you want to ask a question yourself, you can do so um, by using the hashtag TurfChat on Twitter. So if you do that, then we'll address those questions to the group and to Gordon. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to remind the other participants in the room, as I will do as well, to mute your mic uh, when uh, Gordon's giving his presentation. And from that, I'll turn it over to, to Gordon. All right. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. I look forward to discussing um, fertilization today and um, different strategies, sources of fertilizer. Um, let me get this presentation started. I, I just want to say that you know, granular versus foliar fertilizers may be a bit antagonistic. I mean, my general view is that um, they're both strategies, the use of um, both different uh, sources of fertilizer uh, are going to supplement one, one another uh, as part of a, a, an appropriate uh, fertilizer management strategy. So, but I do want to share some differences, which many of them are, are, are basic and a review for some of you, but um, I think it's important to, to start from the beginning. And, um, so I put a presentation together today. I, uh, John asked me to uh, put a few slides together, and um, you let me know when you can see them here. Anything yet, John? Can you guys see the screen? Sorry, Gordy. I was muted. I was trying to talk to you. Yeah, we see everything fine. So we see okay. your, your okay, slide great. exciting era. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, this is a real exciting era for turf grass nutrition. Uh, you know, 2013, there's a lot of different options for, uh, for turf grass managers um, to select, you know, fertilizers that are efficient. I mean, any way we can... Uh, improve efficiency in our lives is certainly a good thing, and um, that can be said for uh, fertilizers. Um, you know, interest has really peaked in the last 15 years, I'd say, and some of those um, areas responsible would be looking at uh, environmental concerns, uh, certainly uh, loss of nutrients uh, through leaching or runoff. Um, there's also been great interest in how to facilitate better uptake, and I think that's where uh, some of the um, more technologically advanced foliar uh, fertilizers uh, can be um, looked at as uh, important for uh, improving efficiency. Um, you know, we continue to understand 
uh, and get a better uh, grasp on uh, plant nutrition and growth, what plants need to, to maximize productivity. Uh, with the uh, increased fertilizer costs, that certainly that's something that we all need to pay attention to and where we can improve efficiency, we can save money. Uh, in addition, uh, there's been more and more research done in the last uh, 10, 15 years on elicitors. Elicitors can be used in combination with uh, various nutrient sources uh, to improve uh, plant health under stress and ultimately uh, help with uh, areas like disease management. So looking at uh, sort of just an overview now and uh, the law of the minimum of uh, uh, plant nutrition would state that uh, plants need all the essential nutrients and none can be none of them can be substituted for one another so that basically uh, uh, mandates that we use a, a balanced approach to fertilization a complete and balanced approach uh, generally fertilization of turf grasses start with nitrogen uh, nitrogen is required in the uh, highest uh, quantities and is responsible for uh, you know, shoot growth and, uh, and root growth to a large extent. Uh, I guess the timing and the source of that nitrogen application is going to dictate um, a lot of, you know, whether or not a fertilizer program is successful or not. Um, you know, I think it's important as well to uh, look at evaluating the, uh, the turf species requirements, certainly with respect to nitrogen and other uh, nutrients, uh, what's the function of the site, uh, what's the stage of growth, and um, you can uh, address your fertilizer concerns uh, appropriately. And then, of course, you know, understanding any soil limitations, correcting major problems, but then also uh, understanding that uh, soil type, both physical and chemical properties, are going to influence uh, specifically granular uh, applications, but also have an influence on uh, topical or foliar applications. Uh, again, some uh, review here, you know, you can select a fertilizer based on its ratio or grade and grade, uh, the ratio being the uh, uh, ratio of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in a fertilizer, uh, and the grade being the analysis, so you can achieve the same ratio with different grades uh, of fertilizer. Uh, a big concern when you're selecting a fertilizer is burn potential. Uh, soluble granular sources applied uh, at the wrong time, I think, would have a higher burn potential uh, than others. Uh, certainly, slow-release nitrogen sources would um, uh, provide less burn potential, and some of the newer technologically advanced foliar options have are very safe uh, for turf grass uh, during all seasons. Uh, again, and sort of the topic of our our chat today is looking at dry versus fluid applications. Um, you know, again, what are the annual nitrogen requirements? How many applications are you going to put out? I mean, you can have a target in your mind. Uh, I'm not a big believer in, um, you know, putting programs in, in, in stone. Uh, it's important to stay uh, uh, fluid uh, in your approach. Uh, again, soil type, uh, reaction effects. Um, what adjustments do you have to make to meet, you know, seasonal changes or during different situations like uh, uh, turf establishment might be one uh, or recovery might be another? And then what type of previous applications have been put out by you or previously by somebody else? Uh, and also, this is going to be influenced by soil type. How much residual nitrogen is in, are in the soils, uh, which is going to have an impact on... Um, you know, how much nitrogen you would need to put out at what rates, sources, timing uh, in a given season. So that's important as well. So again, you've got options. You know, generally I would say that liquid foliar options, you can see there on the spray rig, is going to be uh, dictated by the equipment that you have at your disposal. Uh, there are many uh, turf managers, uh, lawn care operators, whoever, that don't have the kind of spray equipment necessary to make the topical application and they're going to rely primarily on a granular source which is fine um, you know I, I believe that when you're designing your programs that the granular fertilizer uh, should be the foundation and then it's supplemented with a liquid or a foliar approach um, there's a distinction between liquid and foliar fertilizers because liquid fertilizers can be used in high volumes of water and applied to the soil essentially, whereas foliar fertilizers are really designed 
uh, to be used as a, a topical application in a low volume of water. Um, generally, 44 gallons to the acre, but it could be lower than that. You could even apply them in higher volume of water as well. Um, but so essentially, all foliar fertilizers are liquid fertilizers, but not all liquid fertilizers are foliar fertilizers. That's that's the distinction there. So what other factors are going to affect your uh, fertilizer selection? Okay, uh, you got quality expectations. Um, you got, you know, again, the function. Are you removing clippings? Do you have an irrigation system? Uh, many granular fertilizers are going to require uh, some post-application irrigation, and so um, that's going to affect the release of nutrients. Uh, what's the soil type? Is there shade? Do you have disease problems? And what are your uh, recuper recuperative needs? And if you look at sort of, okay, when are you going to apply uh, foliar or liquid versus when are you going to apply granular fertilizers? I mean, again, looking at uh, the, the growth pattern here of cool season grasses, generally you're going to want to apply more granular fertilizers that are soil targeted when you've got actively growing roots. So that's going to be sometime in the spring and in the fall, as you can see on this slide. If you try, try to apply a lot of, uh, you know, dry material to the, to the root zone in the summer months when roots are generally uh, compromised by heat or are uh, just sloughing off and regenerating, um, you know, you're not going to have a whole lot of interception and use by that, by that, uh, by that plant. Now, we know that, that plants have evolved to take up nutrients through the roots, but there are certain times where, you know, it's just not going to be as efficient as a topical application um, one as a, a foliar application, okay? Uh, if you look historically, as this is just a little bit of research on different crops of um, nitrogen recovery comparison. On the left side there, you see the percent of nitrogen recovered as a soil application, and, you know, you're aging somewhere from 10 to, to 40%. Uh, if you look at the foliar application on the right, uh, you can get upwards to, um, you know, well, it's higher and even up to 99% in this case uh, for tomato. Generally speaking, foliar applications are more efficient than soil applied applications. If you wanted to, for instance, correct the nutrient deficiency, you would likely apply the nutrient as a foliar, okay? So what we did, um, well, first I just want to mention that there's been plenty of work done looking at sort of the, the spoon feeding approach, the, uh, the low dose frequent applications of nitrogen. That's really sums up foliar fertilization uh, and found that, you know, you can achieve better turf quality, a better control over growth. Um, you, know, you can actually use it as part of like a, you know, batch management program where you're limiting biomass accumulation, just good agronomics. Uh, low dose frequent applications of nutrient if you if you have the you know the resources to do so um, I think you can save money when they're used correctly uh, I mentioned the, the important distinction between the liquid and the foliar application and one of the things that you know when you're bypassing the roots with a foliar application I think you have a big benefit during um, you know stress extremes generally non-living stresses like heat drought salinity uh, when you combine that with uh, living pests like pathogens, you can um, just promote better plant health and better um, stress tolerance. Uh, I want to mention briefly, not getting into too, too uh, rigorously into uh, plant physiology here, but th the nutrients are basically uh, taken up by the plant through the leaf uh, in what is called ectodesmata. These are nanopores uh, in the leaf. Uh, it was originally believed that uh, the nutrients were taken up and, and were moving through the stomata. However, uh, it didn't turn out to be the case. I mean, stomata is, you know, primarily a one-way street uh, for gas exchange. Um, and so getting uh, materials into the plant, nutrients into the plant, is achieved through uh, these nanopores. Uh, generally, they uh, have a diameter less than a nanometer. Um, they're readily permeable to solutes such as urea and other nutrients, uh, but not so much to larger molecules like um, synthetic chelates 
and um, you know, other molecules that are, are larger than a nanometer. So uh, there's been some research done. We did a little bit of work uh, over the years, uh, starting in 2006, on different turf grass species. Um, we did uh, two years worth of conducted two years worth of data, um, and I want to just talk about this uptake by subtraction method. There's been a recent article published, in, and this is probably an area of discussion when I'm finished. Uh, there was a recent article published in the um, USGA Green Section Record. Uh, they had funded some work at uh, Arkansas and the University of Illinois, and, and they used a uh, radio label. So they basically uh, used an isotope of nitrogen and traced it, uh, traced it through the plant, um, urea and um, uh, potassium nitrate, I believe. And uh, their, their numbers were slightly less than ours. We used a different method. We used this uptake by subtraction method, which... Uh, and here's here's a uh, and I can give you this uh, information when we're finished, uh, but this was the uh, the publication there for this work. Basically, the material goes out, uh, the cores are pulled. Um, there's uh, then w we basically wash off uh, after a certain amount of time. We wash off and uh, collect a rinseate, which is determined to have been the material not uh, absorbed by the plant. And then, uh, so we subtract then the amount in the untreated because you just, I mean, there's probably just some residual sitting on, on the leaf surface. And then we subtract the amount in the wash and we end up with uh, the amount absorbed. And what we found in this research was that, uh, and this was again uh, applied in uh, 88 gallons to the acre or two gallons of water per 1,000 square feet. John, I'm sorry for the. Uh, for the units here, I don't have everything uh, off the top of my head in metric, but uh, what we found was that uh, without irrigation or rainfall, movement to the soil was rare and that um, the nitrogen and phosphorus were not in the thatch. So a lot of it was obviously um, on the turf canopy and uh, being absorbed there. Now, uh, for bent grass, this was at the University of Nebraska. You can see this is the, the uh, the graph showing the percent uptake at, uh, across or over time for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And you can see it's a pretty high clip, uh, upwards, you know, greater than 60% absorbed within um, 60 minutes, and then uh, increasing slightly uh, moving forward. Looking at some of these other nutrients, um, one of the important things to, to point out here is that Generally, magnesium and calcium or uh, nutrients that have a, a higher valency or are larger in diameter, uh, you know, again, it's more difficult to, to, their permeability coefficient is lower, so they don't get into the, into the plant through the foliage as efficiently as some of the other nutrients uh, because of their charge and size. And you can see there's a lag there, so, you know, you only get 35% uptake according to this graph, uh, within 60 minutes, and then it, it increases over time, uh, different from the other nutrients. All right, here's a look at uh, same, same uh, methodology on annual bluegrass at Michigan State University, and uh, similar results for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, pretty efficient uptake there. And then here's a look again at some of the uh, minor nutrients and secondary macronutrients. Um, not as efficient as um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And in this case, you know, zinc and manganese were, were pretty, pretty uh, efficient from an uptake standpoint. Now, what we did as a follow-up to this work, that was in the field. And what we decided to do, because we wanted to shorten that interval and see essentially how quickly these nutrients were being taken up by the plant, um, we did some work in the greenhouse on uh, bent grass maintained at a, a quarter inch height and found that, um, as you can see here, and this, I don't have it on the X axis, but the first time measurement was taken at 15 minutes and there was greater than 60% uptake for uh, all the nutrients, um, that you can see here. And you can't, you can't radio label every nutrient. So, I mean, nitrogen is the easiest and it's the safest. Um, so this is information that we're getting on a variety of nutrients. I mean, again, that work 
that's recently published is only for nitrogen. And uh, while certainly is very useful, uh, our results differed a little bit. They didn't find nearly as much um, uh, uh, uptake in nitrogen on cool season turf. And some of you might have read that study, and we can talk about it here. So when are you going to foliar feed? Well, primarily when nutrients are readily leached on sand, high sand systems that you know don't hold a lot of nutrients to start, uh, or they're you know high. There's a lot of drainage and a lot of uh, nutrient is leached, like potassium, for instance, which is um, a very leachable uh, nutrient. Low C C soils. You want to achieve good color without excessive growth. Uh, correcting nutrient deficiencies, as I mentioned, and during environment, environmental stress. And then you can get into sort of just best fertilizer management, which, uh, you know, generally uh, you want to limit nitrogen leaching, nitrate nitrogen leaching. Um, so you're going to look at different sources that are going to uh, uh, limit this. Uh, also volatilization of urea at higher pH, generally above 7.3, you get a higher instance of, uh, of urea volatilizing. So if your irrigation water is, is you know, alkaline, uh, that could become a problem. Uh, using slow release carriers, there's really great options for, for dry granule, granule uh, slow release carriers that are very efficient and really predictable from a standpoint of release, whether it's water, uh, temperature, or microbial activity. Uh, you can get very good quality slow release carriers where you can apply uh, and also at a very uh, good physical you know particle size analysis little dust you know beautiful beautiful products um, you know obviously you don't want to over apply nitrogen so that's where sort of spoon feeding I think is very valuable uh, applying nitrogen at the correct time you know a lot of that's a lot of this is, is common sense uh, you know, not applying uh, soluble nitrogen to frozen ground kind of thing. It would be an example. Um, not over applying phos phosphorus. Many soils are high in phosphorus. Uh, there's legislation coming uh, in the pipeline here in the U.S. and a lot of states uh, limiting uh, phosphorus and also nitrogen timing and source of uh, application. So, uh, you know, you might want to pay attention to... Uh, uh, legislation in the pipeline in your local community uh, moving forward. Again, do you have control over some water? That's going to uh, dictate what you can do in a lot of ways from a fertilizer application standpoint. And then, you know, again, just maximizing health using all the cultural practices at your disposal. And, um, you yeah, that would include water management, top dressing, mowing heights, uh, aeration, you know, mechanical renovation, that kind of thing. But fertil fertilization is one of those uh, important cultural practices that's going to be, you know, forming the foundation for uh, for plant health. So uh, that's what I've got uh, from a presentation standpoint, and I look forward to uh, discussing it with you. Good, Gordy. Um, you got everybody complaining in the in, on Twitter about the differences. Um, and a lot of the discussions around, somebody said, let me find it so that I can get their name and get it right. Um, so Michael Woods is obviously commenting too. He says um, he prefers liquid, he prefers granular versus liquid in terms of terminology. He doesn't, I don't know if he doesn't believe in a foliar. I don't know. I'm trying to get him to um, say more about it. But then somebody asked, um, oh man, I'm not organized here. Basically, they said, isn't a liquid a liquid? And I think you kind of went through it. But can you, so someone said it, it's right here. It's uh, Drum Seed Turf. I don't know who that is. Andrew McDaniel from uh, Kea Golf Club in Japan, actually. Um, and we're an international bunch here. This is awesome. Um, and if you want to unshare your screen, Gordy, then you'll, uh, we'll pop up to be able to see you again. Um, so he said, isn't liquid liquid, regardless of the form that it's applied? And, um, even if you're not talking about foliar versus liquid, uh, I think that the answer is no, because I think there's a lot of differences, like you know, a nitrate base versus a urea base versus an ammonium base um, fertility. But um, can you answer that question? Isn't a liquid just a liquid? 
or can you talk well, to that? Well, a liquid, a liquid is a liquid, but I think that certainly uh, some f formulations differ. Uh, the inert ingredients differ. The, the way they're designed to be used differs. Um, you know, you can melt down your own um, nutrient and come up with a liquid fertilizer. How that uh, uh, performs and reacts uh, under the same environmental conditions is going to be very different from uh, a liquid fertilizer that's designed for uh, topical uptake or, or, or leaf uptake. So just from the standpoint of a liquid, and you just said it, like when we put down fertilizer at our research plots, we might choose urea and we just take an ag-based urea and just melt it down basically and put it in and spray it as a foliar. But I know a lot of times we worry about volatilization and losing some of the nitrogen in terms of research plots, and so then we might put something down like um, ammonium nitrate or something, some other form of uh, nitrogen because of how it's going to react and what's going to happen. I'm not worried about foliar uptake in this case. I'm just worried about volatilization. Um, but there's definitely differences in terms of, uh, you know, a liquid foliar, a liquid fertilizer from a formulation standpoint. Um, I, I don't know. It, um, Mike, had, Mike had sent a link, and I'm going to see if I can get back to that. He sent a link to an article that he wrote on his blog, and he referenced um, some things. So let me see if I can find that. Um, but go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, I, I think the, for nitrogen, I, I don't think that the, um, the, the, the nuance of the formulation matters as much as it might for um, applying sort of uh, secondary macro and micronutrients as a topical application. I think there's there's bigger differences for those types of nutrients. Um, but I think safety is a big one, and I think compatibility is a big one as well. I mean, if you can, if you're using uh, charged particles uh, in a spray solution and you're tank mixing with, you know, four, five, six other things, I think there's a greater chance that um, that those that, that won't react well in the tank and you can have problems. But I'm going to... Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, but in, in response to, to uh, Micah, yeah, I don't think he uh, is convinced that, you know, you can get nutrients like calcium, magnesium into the plant as a, as a foliar. Right, so, well, I, I'm reading his blog, and... I'm doing this because he comments on it. Um, he said it's he said foliar fertilization it has it in italics is often used to describe li liquid applications made to the leaves or foliage, but this can be misleading with the implication that all li applied fertilizer is being taken up by the foliage. He said the reality is only about 50% of the fertilizer applied to the foliage enters the plant through the leaves. In many cases, less than 50% is absorbed. And then he cites a couple of researchers. Um, Bruce Branham, um, he said he found that 14 to 37 uh, percent was of the applied nitrogen was taken up by the leaves in Illinois, and then Stiegler, well, I guess it was at Arkansas probably, um, found that 36 to 69 percent of foliar applied nitrogen. Now I haven't read these articles, so I don't really know exactly um, what they're referring to, and I'm going to tweet out the the links to the to the articles. But you're obviously more up to date on the the different research that's been done, and you showed a few. You showed something from Nebraska um, and somewhere else, and most of them, I think all of them, were above 60% within 15 minutes. I don't know the details of those research. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, why would why would these researchers find 14 to 37 or 36 to 69, but the stuff that you cited show, you know, greater than 60 in the first few minutes? I, I don't know the actual nitrogen applied or fertilizers applied. I don't know a lot of the details of the research. Um, and you may not be familiar with the two studies he quoted either, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but in case you knew that. Yeah, well, you know, they, they used a, a radio-labeled nitrogen source, N15, and um, so they're able to trace it sort of, I think, uh, in a more rigorous way. Uh, it's probably more accepted in the uh, academic community to uh, evaluate uptake using that method. Um, the, uh, the method that was used um, in the, the four studies that, that I had mentioned in my presentation was a little bit more crude, um, maybe not quite as refined, uh, and that's maybe where we see the differences, that discrepancy there. Okay. So maybe you're getting a little bit more off on yours than what they were getting in terms of C uh, radio-labeled um, nitrogen going into the plant. But it's... Yeah. 
it's expensive. It's expensive to do those those kinds of trials. It's also uh, on some le level uh, not as you know. It's, there's some safety concerns there too. So um, there are some limitations as far as what we can do. And you can only you can only look at nitrogen there too. So there's I mean, there may be other ways to look at to radio label other nutrients. I don't know how safe it is, um, but you know that's only nitrogen for this. Right. And so um, you don't have to bring it back. But what were the nutrients and the micronutrients that you had listed on that one slide? I know that you had a bunch listed. And yeah, we looked at we looked at we looked at all of them. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and that that work was published. So. Yeah. So there's obviously a lot of discussion or I don't want to say discrepancies as much as differing, differing opinions in terms of whether, you know, a liquid's actually a foliar um, or a foliar uptake exists. Um, you know, based on the studies that Mike pointed out by Stiegler and by, who was the other person? Oh, by Bruce Branham, um, they're still seeing a percentage of nitrogen being taken up. Um, so... I don't know, your, your Greg Brothers' whole product line is foliar fertilizers, right? So, yeah. Well, yeah, well, there's a, we have... No, I know you have other yeah. stuff, but that's, yeah. that's a major part of your product line. So um, you obviously, you know, your company obviously has strong opinions about <laughs> the benefits of foliar uh, uptake um, in fertilizers. And so, um, I don't know, I'll turn it over to anybody else, Mike or John or Paul, if anybody has questions, and I'll keep monitoring... Uh, Twitter to see if uh, anything's anybody else is coming with questions. Um, you might be muted. Go ahead, Paul. You might be muted. I, so I have, have to ask, um, what about foliar tissue testing? You know, before and after applications or trying to come up with some benchmark, and do you find that foliar testing, uh, tissue testing is efficient at all or accurate? Well, we do see an increase in nutrient after a foliar application, but you have to tissue test right away. I mean, I don't put a whole lot of stock into a tissue test only because it's just such a snapshot in you know at one specific time, and things are ever changing within the plant. Uh, but certainly, it is a way to fine tune things, and I think it can be used effectively if you um, do it routinely. Yeah, I was more thinking just from your testing perspective rather than trying to wash the nutrients off and find out what was applied and what was absorbed. Could you not do a tissue test before and immediately after application? Another couple of questions I have is we find we just get a better response from granular no matter what we do. Um, we go out at, at a tenth, two tenths of a pound of urea or ammonium sulfate depending on the time of year. Uh, but if I put down two tenths of a pound of a granular, I just seem to get much better response. Is there any um, obvious reasons for that that I just don't understand? No, if you're putting out a, gra a soluble granular source at the right time, uh, I would expect you to get a really great response. Um, you know, uh, I don't think there's the I don't think there's anything magical about that. I just think there are certain times uh, for cool season grasses. Now, um, I guess we focused on that, but there's there's other reasons for warm season grasses. But for cool season grasses in you know the mid Atlantic of the U.S. where there's quite a bit of stress and, and heat and, and drought and you know plants growing on sand that you know there's there's a a, a real value in um, supplying nutrients uh, topically. Yeah, we found even in the middle of the summer, July for example, we put down a granular application in April or May during aeration and again in the fall just to kind of create some background fertility and also help with the aeration recovery. But when we get to June and July start going through drought stress and we get very little precipitation, actually no precipitation in the summer months at all. And since the use of the soil moisture probe is really trying to keep our soil moisture low, so in the 20% range, we just don't see any response from foliar applications. And even in July, um, and I hate to promote a product, but it's the only one that I know, is the Nutri DG line where you can go at it at such a low rate that we just got unbelievable response and even in July with just a two-tenth of a pound application of of their product. Well, when you say when you say response, I mean you're talking about a green up response, right? Yeah, just color density, um, 
even an actual response to other fertilizer applications after that. So, and to be sure, I did just a couple spots in the middle of the greens, in the worst sections of the greens, and it, they just looked terrible. You know, they started to thin out. We're starting to have moss problems in those areas. And then an application of the DG product just in one spot, never told any staff, never told the soil moisture measuring staff that we had out doing soil moisture measuring, and just to see what kind of responses they saw. And they all came back and asked. And these are kids that really don't know anything about turf grass management. Said, what's going on in the middle of this green and what's going on in the middle of that green as compared to our program. And our liquid program on greens is you know, about fourteen to $18,000, so it's not an inexpensive program. And then to see a response from a $700 granular app, it was quite surprising. I would suggest that you've been doing all the other things, the cultural practices and other areas of management very well. You must have really, you know, dense, deep roots. He's in Victoria, too. They don't have any yeah. problems up there. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with what you're doing if it's working that well, yeah? That's my well, that, that's, that goes without saying. I mean, anytime we start talking about you know, new and latest, greatest technology and all of these things. I mean, I get the question all the time. Will you tell us to do this? I'm like, well, if, it's, if everything's working for you already, then don't listen to me. Just do, just do whatever you're currently doing. Um, it's usually only if you have challenges or problems. Um, it, just, it just seems counterintuitive, though. You know, yeah, it's the wrong time you're to be putting out granular. It, it seems like everything else we should be doing should work, but but the one thing that we shouldn't be doing is, is working, is the granular app. It, I just thought maybe there's something in the soil chemistry, maybe my carbonates, maybe my pH, something that's making, or maybe my selection of nitrogen. You know, we use a fair bit of urea. I find that ammonium sulfate works a bit better, but the number of bags that you have to mix is, is obviously twice as many, which makes it difficult in the morning when you're trying to get out of golf. So I, I thought maybe there was something that I was choosing in product selection in my foliar program that may not be the most efficient. I don't know. Maybe you're um, getting a granular response uh, or a, a pH response with a granular. If you're using ammonium sulfate and urea, those are both acidifiers. If, if you've got an alkaline soil, maybe there's something going on there. Maybe. Urea shouldn't change the pH much. It shouldn't acidify. It's pretty basic. Um, whereas ammonium sulfate definitely would. You might get a slight drop initially, but we did work looking at routine applications of urea, and it just basically stays the same. Um, but the ammonium sulfate, depending on your soil, should should lower the pH if if, if it doesn't if it's not too heavily buffered. Um, John, you're so we got people from Western Canada. Mike, where are you located? Southern California. Right, Southern California, uh, the UK or Ireland. Are you in, you're in Ireland, right? Not the UK. Sorry. <laughs> here in Ireland um, and and so then we had somebody commenting from uh, Japan as well so we've got a pretty diverse group here and obviously things are going to be slightly different um, in all of these areas in terms of uh, weather and all of those types of things. John what are you guys seeing over in Ireland in terms of application of foliar versus granular? I know that people if you get to the UK it's fairly minimalist I think in Ireland um, I'd say that they are a little bit higher maintenance than some of the Lynx courses. I could be wrong, but you can tell me. Yeah, you're muted, John. Sorry, I think I muted you uh, when Cordy was talking. Still muted. Just hover over your picture at the bottom and then click on your microphone. It should take you off mute. Nope. <laughs> Maybe your mic isn't working. I know it was working earlier, but uh, it's not coming in. So um, let's see if he can get his mic straightened out. Um, anybody I, else? Go ahead, yeah, I've Mike. got a question regarding rate on the foliar uptake and that you showed. You know, you get like... You said something about 60% uptake in the first 60 minutes, and then it grows, you know, it, it, it increases. Well, if you're putting down a tenth of a pound per thousand, it takes up roughly half of it in the first 60 minutes. The rest of it goes up. If you put two tenths of a pound per thousand down, why wouldn't it take up, does it take up twice as much? I mean, I, it, how does rate factor into that? Yeah, that's that's a good question, Mike. I don't, I don't know the answer um, because we haven't done... The work but we we apply the the the, uh, the tenth of a pound, um, so I'm I'm not sure. 
I usually have questions like that that nobody can answer. So. <laughs> well, and I don't know either. I don't know the answer to that. We need like Max Schlossberg in here, but um, you know, it seems to me that if you're going to put down a granular at 210, and even if it's primarily you know a quick release product, and, and we're not talking just like straight urea, but you know something that's primarily quick release, it's still there longer than say if you put down a half a pound of a liquid, you know, just a liquid fertilizer, liquid urea. I would imagine that the plant's going to take up whatever it can, and then it's going to be gone relatively quickly, at least through a sand-based system, um, you know, where you're getting a lot of water movement through. So that could be some of the difference in terms of the response between two tenths of a pound of a liquid nitrogen or liquid feed like a liquid urea versus a granular application. Um, you know, it may just be hanging around longer that it's still giving that continuous feed for a full week as opposed to a few days. I don't know. Yeah, so, some of that might be, so in in that study, those USGA funded studies, they, they made a recommendation. They, they believe that if you apply something, uh, a nutrient topically, that once it dries, it can no longer be uh, absorbed by leaf tissue and subsequently if it rains or if you irrigate, that that material is washed off the leaf and absorbed by the roots. So they were recommending then that if you apply a what would be called a foliar fertilizer, that you irrigate. Uh, I, I think if I'm quoting it, several hours after you apply it, which I just don't think is practical, but um, that's just my opinion. You're saying that they're saying you can water it in an hour or two later, or several Se hours? several several hours after you apply it. And your opinion is once you put it on, whenever it dries, it's done, or what? No, my opinion isn't that once it's their their opinion that it is that once it dries, it's done. My opinion is that based on our understanding, and you can see those those charts that, um, you know, even after 10, 12 hours, there's still that 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 curve is going up and the, the uptake is increasing. Uh, can you hear me now, guys? Yeah, we're good. We hear you. I found my microphone. Uh, you're saying about applications over here in Ireland. The general term would be to use a granular at the start of the season, around March, and follow up with another granular in September. But then right through the rest of the year, it's all foliars as applied. Uh, light applications going out at around 0.4 grams of, uh, of nitrogen per square meter in each app. And this usually keeps our greens ticking along just nicely right through the summer. Then again, we don't get extreme weather that some of you guys will be getting, of course. Uh, Gordon, you were talking about um, phosphorus limitations, uh, legislation over in, in Canada and the States. How do you reckon that would impact on phosphate applications? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think at this point, uh, they are uh, differentiating between orthophosphate or PO4 uh, with uh, PO3 only because you know the research to date would show that uh, there's no nutrient value in a phosphate application, therefore um, its ramifications could be different um, as far as environmental pollution goes. So. Um, I think at this point they're they're not going to uh, ban or limit phosphate applications. I could be wrong if someone knows differently. What do you What do you think, John? Um, I was checking Twitter, and I have to be honest, I didn't get all of what you were saying. I know you were mentioning about the phosphates and the uh, fertilizer implications, and whether they were going to potentially ban some of that. Um, I, I don't I don't know. I don't think anyone knows really. Has it happened Gordy? anywhere yet, Gordy? Do you know? I don't. I don't think that lawmakers are quite savvy enough, uh, or you know, will think enough to you know be able to to uh, make that differentiation. I, I think they're just gonna. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think they're just gonna look at it as phosphate, and that's it. And I don't even think they're gonna include phosphite in it in, this, in the band. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I haven't even. I hadn't even really thought of that. I mean, the the phosphorus bands, those are obviously popping up all over the place, and that's a totally different issue. But um, 
I guess that there's benefit to having your phosphate labeled as a fungicide as opposed to a fertilizer um, if the band comes out, um, but a lot more expensive to get it through EPA that way. That's, that's true. John, you're doing a lot of work with phosphites, aren't they, over there, right, on the microdotium? Trying to, all right, yeah. Final year at the moment now, so it's trying to pull it all together. Yeah. We're also doing the study on phosphite as a source of pea nutrition as well, which is producing some interesting results. Okay. So um, it doesn't look like, Gordy, there's uh, much more in terms of questions. I think that the biggest hang-up that I'm seeing on Twitter and just people talking about turf chat is you know, the terminology of foliar and liquid and the interchangeability. And I think you stated at the very beginning that not all liquid foli all foliar fertilizers are liquids, but not all liquids are foliar. I think you've made it pretty clear that you're not calling everything that's sprayed out through a, a spray tank a foliar fertilizer, correct? Correct. Okay, so everybody's complaining about it, but no, it's a liquid. Think, they're, li they're all liquid fertilizers. But then I would I would suggest that um, you could take it out one level further and make uh, uh, clearly identify differences between uh, some formulations that would uh, classify them as a foliar fertilizer. In other words, they're just designed for leaf uptake, whereas others are not. Right. Like if we're just going to apply urea in a liquid form, we're probably going to water that in and expect most of it's going to be taken up by the roots and not through foliar uptake. Although maybe some is. I mean, who knows? I don't follow the literature that much in terms of foliar um, or fertilizer in general. Um, but I think people are just, you know, like, oh, everybody feels like they're, they're used too interchangeably. Like everything that, anytime somebody thinks they spray, that it's going to be a foliar fertilizer. The other thing that came up is, um, with the articles that were published, the USGA-based articles or wherever, whoever funded that research um, at Arkansas and uh, I don't remember where the, hell the other one was. Um, okay, so they showed, you know, 30%, maybe someone said 30 to 60% or something, and your numbers were higher. And I guess maybe part of the, you know, if you're playing the devil's advocate, you say, oh, well, the research shows it's only... I, I gotta look at that number if I can find it. I, I have the number here, John. It's uh, uh, thirty-six to sixty-nine percent. Right. That was the Stiegler uh, one, and then their Bruce Brandon was fourteen to thirty-seven. So it said six to thirty, six to thirty-four. Okay. I don't. I was reading his blog where he summarized it, where Micah summarized it. But so anyway, so what? So there's fourteen. Say the numbers Micah used are what you said: six to thirty-four, thirty-six to sixty-nine. Um, and then you all come out, right? Greg Brothers comes out, and you're a big bad company that you know has to promote your stuff, right? That's what everybody thinks. Um, you come out and you say, well, we're finding that we're at 60% in 15 minutes, and then it's, it goes up slightly, and it goes up for 10 hours. So I guess the semantics of it become, um, well, what if it was only 36 or 40%? Is that still a good number that's going to have an impact on? The turf grass, and is it is the argument is the argument a lot just more people saying, well, your numbers are more inflated than what we're finding in our research. Like to me, like if we could get if I could get thirty six percent foliar absorption into the plant, that seems like a fairly large number in terms of the amount of fertility going into it. And does that also mean that the rest of it, um, just because it didn't go in foliarly quickly, that it's lost and never going to be used by the plant? Maybe it's still, I assume that your fertilizers that it go on foliarly could still be taken up by the roots if they did make it to the soil. John? Well, I mean, practically speaking, we generally see the same, I mean, very similar results uh, side by side if you put out, you know, just a, strictly talking about nitrogen. Um, given the same set of, you know, environmental conditions and soil type, you know, see a pretty similar response. So. Uh, John? Go ahead. Uh, well, we uh, measured phosphate intake on, on Creep and Bent, and uh, 12 hours post foliar application, we had 80% uh, in the leaf, and we measured using ion chromatography. So we're actually measuring the exact amount of ions in the in the leaf. So we had fairly good uptake there. We also could trace it 
he was a plant into the roots as well. Okay. So you're talking about phosphite. Um, well, you know, as a, a one of the right, you know, you know one of the uh, you know various measured, things that we're talking about getting in. We also measured PO4 at the same time, of course, with the same uh, in inputs. Yeah, and so there's been a couple other comments. Um, uh, well, Matt said, Matt Nelson chimed in. He said, uh, clearly differences in formulations, too, between soluble and foliar products um, involving pH, charge, uh, as well as chelating agents. So, I mean, I, I think that it goes without, without a doubt. It goes to say that not all products are created alike and some things are, you know, have different use. I'm not an advocate of anybody's product or anyone because I don't really care. I'm like, whatever works for you works. And um, if you have the budget to do it and use some of the more expensive ones, if you don't need that and you go with a nitrogen that's just a urea, aggregate urea base, and that works for you, then, then great. So I don't really have an issue. Um, I just always hear people complaining about uh, the discussion regarding foliar versus liquid. And uh, I think we've basically said that there's a difference and they're not the same. Um, and so I think we've we've quelched some of the complaining <laughs> on Twitter. I mean, with with this presentation, John, and with others uh, that I uh, put together, and, and talking to golf course superintendents, I mean, I'm just trying to present the facts. I, I don't think that uh, certainly I work for Grig Brothers, but um, my job is to you know evaluate the research we we do and what others do, and and tell a story and uh, and do it. Um, you know, as best I can with the facts, and um, you know that's what what I, I think I did today. And um, I, th I think there are differences, but I think you know we're still learning. And I think part of what you're saying is that maybe we've done too good a job of like the whole branding with the foliar thing, and so now people just automatically call it foliar when in fact probably a majority of people should just say we go with a liquid application. Um, but um, more and more practitioners now use that term foliar because, you know, years ago uh, we started to look at the differences between the foliars and the liquids. And uh, maybe it's just, you know, we're, the message is getting, it got out effectively and that's why. And people don't like it. Right. Well, again, I, don't, I think exactly what you said is, is correct. So um, I think what we'll do, I don't want to just beat a dead horse, and unless anybody has any questions, I think that it basically, this, as these always do, it's just this is a very basic set of information to generate discussion, and the discussion will continue on um, at local pint pubs, <laughs> over a local pint at pubs um, during conference season, and people can talk about it. Um, and, you know, some people have strong opinions about it, and other people like me are more like, eh, <laughs> you know, call it what you want. It's more semantics to me. Um, but unless anybody, Rob, uh, Paul, did you have anything? Were you going to say something else? Okay, so what we'll do, um, we'll wrap it up. Uh, obviously, I want to thank uh, Gordon for joining us and giving the presentation. It was awesome. Um, what I'll do is I'll go left to right, and you can basically say your final words and thoughts and promote anything you have coming up, Gordy. Uh, I know that you have uh, a TurfNet episode tomorrow, so you, you know, definitely mention that. when you are going to be talking about that. Um, so you start. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating, uh, both your live and um, on social media. Uh, certainly there will be uh, more debate, and I love stimulating uh, debate. So. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, yeah, tomorrow I've got a uh, webinar on TurfNet uh, where I'll be uh, talking about coloring turf with uh, with colorants, um, differences between pigments and paints, uh, how they can be used beyond sort of cosmetics um, uh, for turf managers. And uh, so like switching gears completely from, of course, fertilizer, which we can generate a color response to just forgetting about the fertilizer and painting it green. So I hope anybody can join me for that tomorrow. Thanks again. All right, thanks. John? Uh, well, <clears throat> delighted to have been taking part here today. It's one of my first hangouts, I think they're called. So I'm looking forward to, to do a few more. And just let everyone know that I'll be heading over to Orlando in, Gen in February. So you can get all the information on phosphate then. Are you giving a presentation there? I believe I am somewhere, yeah. Of course. <laughs> I don't know more about it. <laughs> I'm just, just going to fly over and turn up. 
<laughs> hopefully, sure hopefully you make it to the educational sessions and not just uh, to, the, yeah. to the pubs, you know. Um, John, where are you located in Ireland? I'm in uh, the Cora, it's called. It's about 30 miles from Dublin. It's a large oh. grassland. has been since uh, Neolithic times. So it's a very, uh, it's actually dedicated as a national monument. So it's a very special area of, of grassland. Okay, well, I'm sure that myself as well as several other Penn Staters will be in that area next August when Penn State plays in Dublin. So uh, maybe we'll have to, to meet up over there if we don't see each other in Orlando. I'll be away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Mike. Uh, sorry I got into this one a little bit late. I was uh, watching Doug Soldat's presentation that GCSA had put on this morning, so I had to transfer over. I lost a few minutes' time, so I'm going to have to watch the, uh, the YouTube video to get catch the first five or ten minutes that I missed, but uh, enjoyed the conversation. I don't have much else to add uh, beyond that this morning. So, Okay. Likewise, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, putting on this presentation. That was great. I thought it was very unbiased, and I, I definitely understand the difference between liquid and foliar, so I think that was probably uh, made too big of an issue. Uh, I did want to promote the CJSA conference in February the 17th to the 21st in Vancouver. If anybody hasn't been to Vancouver, it's probably the most beautiful city in North America. To get a chance to come over for the Canadian conference, it's an unbelievable place, good lineup, so please hope to see you there. All right, that's a ballsy statement. Most beautiful city in North America. I have to say, I, it's one of my favorites, and I will be there. I think I'm giving uh, a full day seminar on turf diseases, and then like another two other one hour seminars on topics that I have no idea. Whatever um, uh, Catherine got me to do. So um, I don't know what I have coming up here. Um, basically, right in the middle of classes with my students. I, I will say actually. If there's any superintendents out there that watch this that are looking to host interns, now is the perfect opportunity to uh, start sending information in. <clears throat> is that you, Paul? I take one. You'll take one in Ireland? I'm happy to go over there and visit them if they go to Ireland. Um, but yeah, this is a really good time. The students, uh, at least the two-year students, haven't started applying, and they're really going to be um, getting it going here in the next two weeks. And then the other thing I want to promote is our Golf Turf Conference uh, registration is now open for the Penn State Golf Turf Conference. All education, um, usually about 500 people come to campus and it's a really good um, it's a really good conference. So you can, you can check that out. Just Google Penn State Golf Turf Conference. All right, so that's it. We hit right about the hour mark, so we're right on time. Everything's good. So again, Gordon, I want to thank you for coming and sharing the information. I agree with Paul. It's, I don't think anything was biased. I think that people just have issues with semantics, um, and I think it was pretty clear that you know you, you made it clear to me anyway in terms of um, the differences uh, as much as can be made um, in 55 minutes <laughs> um, in, a, in a hangout. All right, so the discussion will continue online, and uh, we'll see you next time, whenever that's going to be. So I think we might have to get something on pigments and something on phosphites. That's what everybody's saying now. So, John, you're going to be called back <laughs> to, to do a presentation next time you uh, join us. In, in, uh, you might be sorry. <laughs> well, well, we'll see how your presentation skills are as, as a student, as a, as a faculty member, and a judge at some of these conferences. I, I don't have a problem uh, grading you very hard if you, you don't do a good job, but I'm sure you do great. All right, so thanks again. I appreciate everybody, and uh, and we're out. All right, All right buddy. Thanks. All right, bye. Yeah, bye.